And once again, turn with us to the 23rd Psalm. Now, let me go ahead and just uh, say something right quick. So, if you remember, I guess it was about, uh, I don't know, maybe three months ago, something like that, uh, when Dad was dealing with um, Philemon, we were talking about how that Paul was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I took that literal. Some of you getting it now, huh? My jacket looks like it's an old Tommy prisoner garb, so I just took it literal, you know. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and so I'm wearing it right now. Amen? <laughs> 23rd Psalm, 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we are grateful and thankful that we have the opportunity to break open the bread of life and to study your word, to teach your word, for your word is life unto us. We ask for your anointing to teach your word, anoint us to hear what you would have us to say. We ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Just to bring us up to speed, now how many of you know that repetition is a good thing? And so every Wednesday night I try to bring us up to speed for some of you who may were not here or may have not been here last week. So the last couple of weeks we were diving into this notion that as sheep, as people of God, our shepherd is going to lead us at times into uh, the valley of the shadow of death. But he does so for a specific reason. Number one, it's to teach us to trust him, to teach us to depend upon him. It's to teach us that he is able to do anything, that he's able to provide for us even in the midst of that valley. But at the same time as... He leads us through this valley of the shadow of death. It is for a reason to take us to a higher plane. He takes us, any time that we go through a trial or a tribulation, understand that once you come through it, he's elevating you. He's bringing you to a higher plane. He's bringing you up. He's bringing you closer to him. And so when we think to ourselves or we wonder why does God allow these things to happen, well, once again, it's to teach us some things about ourselves, but it's also to teach us some things about him and allow him to bring us closer to where he is. And he prepares as he, as we mentioned it last week, he brings us to this higher plane which he has prepared for us. He took time to survey this land, to prepare this table land, if you will, this mesa, this mountaintop. And yet he does so for us, for our peace, for our rest, and for our safety. But how many of you know that even whenever you get to the mountaintop, it doesn't mean that you're free from problems? I want to say that one more time. Even though God has brought you through the valley of the shadow of death, where you fear no evil because his rod and his staff, they comfort us. And he leads us to that table and he prepares a table in the midst of our enemies. While our enemies are all around trying to destroy us, God literally sets up a table and allows us to feast on his goodness. Amen. But even in the midst of the peace and the rest and the provision that God has given us, it doesn't mean that we are free from life's annoyances. 
even on the mountaintop. You see, we have a, 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 a thought, and it's, it's really a, a, a false thought, that once we get to that mountaintop and that higher plane, that, oh, man, it's, it's, we're all good from here. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. Everything's great. Everything's going to be fine. But that's not really the case. Even though, yes, things are better, it doesn't take away life's annoyances. It doesn't take away the problems that you and I will face, even in God's table land. And there are some things that I want to look at here this week, tonight, specifically found in the second half of verse number five. And I want to read it to you just one more time, that second half, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. So let's take a look at this for a second. What does this mean? He anoints our head with oil. Well, going back in our studies that we have been, or the resources that we have been using, using and utilizing this, this particular book on a shepherd's look at Psalm 23, written by an actual shepherd, he would go on to say this, that here it would appear that the sheep are in sublime setting on the high meadows with their clear running springs where the forage is fresh and tender, where there is an intimate contact with the shepherd. But I like this phrase, but we soon find that there is a fly in the ointment. Even on the mountaintop, hordes of insects can emerge with the advent of warmer weather, which presents a serious problem for the sheep. W. Philip Keller went on to say that several types of insects make livestock miserable. Warble flies, bot flies, heel flies, navel flies, nasal flies, deer flies, black flies, mosquitoes, and gnats, just to name a few. And he goes on to explain one particular fly, the nasal fly. The nasal fly is what it is. It is a fly that flies around the head of the sheep and it can be quite annoying for the sheep. The sheep are trying to find some rest, some respite, some peace, and yet this particular fly is just constantly flying all around them. It's getting to the point where it is annoying them. It's causing them to panic. It's causing them to run rampant across that tableland, trying to escape this nasal fly. But the purpose of the nasal fly is they are trying to find a way into the nasal cavity of the sheep. You want to know why? To lay eggs. And in a few days, if they are successful in getting into the nasal cavity of that sheep, they're able to lay eggs, and within just a few days, those eggs will hatch, and this worm-like larva will start to penetrate and go upwards into its brain. And whenever they have something, look, just, just think about it. It's gross. Talking about anything that's going up somebody or something's nose is disgusting. But can you imagine having something in your nose crawling its way up? You want to talk about annoying? You talk about just a flies flying around is annoying. Talk about a nasal fly in the cavity of a sheep working its way upwards. And when this begins to happen, the sheep will deliberately begin to beat its head against trees. Think about it. Trying to find some sort of rest from this annoyance. And all they know to do is to try to find something that's hard and try to beat their head up against it just to try to find some relief. If it's intense enough, it will kill that sheep. Think about that. 
You have a nasal fly flying around. That's one annoyance. You have that nasal fly, if it's able to get into that nostril cavity of that sheep, it lays its eggs and those eggs hatch and they find its way to the brain. And when that begins to happen, you're talking about sheep butting its head up against something that's hard just so they can try to find some sort of peace. And if it's intense enough, the sheep dies. So what's the remedy for something like that? According to this shepherd, he would say when this begins to happen, the ancient remedy was always oil. They would take their hands in the oil and they would begin to massage it and wipe it across the head of the sheep. And that will provide some sort of respite as the nasal flies will begin to fly away. So it means that even though the flies may be still there, it's not going to penetrate the nasal cavity of the sheep. Let's take this just for a second, because there's another aspect of this that I want to deal with. But let's take this one first, and how does this apply to the Christian life? How does this issue apply to us today? Well, once again, we're not immune from life's annoyances, even on the mountaintop. And at times, as we are on this mountaintop, we're going to find ourselves annoyed by certain things. And it's going to cause us to get ourselves all up in a bunch. You know how it is? You know how you are. Come on, just be real with me. You know how you are whenever you get annoyed. You're in, the, you, listen, you're on the tabletop, you're on the mountaintop, you're on the mesa, you're close to the shepherd, but you have these life's annoyances that are driving you crazy. And they start small, and all of a sudden it begins one right after another, and it seems like they are buzzing all around you. And what happens? Your focus is taken off of your shepherd, and your focus is now on these flies, these annoyances of life. And the devil is trying to weasel his way into your mind to pull you away from what God is doing in your life. He's trying to pull you away from the blessings that God has provided for you. And as he is pulling and trying to pull you away, nudge you away, do something to take your mind off of what God has done for you, you're going to find yourself in a moment where you're beating your head up against a wall, spiritually speaking, trying to find relief. Think about it. We've all been there. Every single one of us have had those moments in life where we are on the mountaintop. God has brought us through something. We are rejoicing, but all of the sudden, without warning, life's annoyances hit, and your attention has become diverted. You're no longer basking in the presence of God, and it seems. It seems like your constant focus is on whatever annoyances that life has presented, and you're completely your, 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 your mind is affected by this, your life is affected by this, and the devil is successful in pulling you away to the point where you feel like you've got to beat your head up against a wall just to find peace. So what is the answer for this? When the scripture says, when David would write and say, he anoints my head with oil. Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. My goodness. I want to just read this to you real quick. These are some things that I wanted to put in, and I wanted to make sure that I wanted to speak correctly. The oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. We face challenges that seem like flies buzzing all around us, small frustrations, unexpected delays, conflicts, worries about the future, personal struggles. But even in the midst of these annoyances, 
The Holy Spirit can flow within our lives to bring about the healing from these annoyances. Left unchecked, listen, left unchecked, these little flies and annoyances can rob us of our peace. They can leave us spiritually weary and emotionally agitated. This is why we need the constant flow of the Holy Spirit working within our lives. This is why we've got to have the constant flow of the Holy Spirit bringing about peace, grace, contentment, rest, and healing. Instead of reacting frantically to every problem, We find strength to trust God and allow the Holy Spirit to work. As he brought us through the valley of the shadow of death, he can bring us through life's annoyances. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. We need the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need the oil of the Holy Spirit to come upon. We need, the, we need the Lord to bathe our heads, spiritually speaking, with the oil of the Holy Spirit. This has got to be constant, ladies and gentlemen. This is not something that you need to do every six months. This is something that we are to do each and every single day. And listen, let me tell you, the only way the Holy Spirit works and can work is through our faith being anchored correctly in Christ and Him crucified. You see, the Holy Spirit desires to work in you. The Holy Spirit desires to move in your heart, to move in your life, to touch you, to minister to you. But he will be handcuffed if our faith is not anchored correctly in the cross of Christ. He will be limited as to what he can do. And if you want the constant flow of the Holy Spirit, get over yourself. I'm going to say it one more time. If you want the constant flow of the Holy Spirit, get over yourself. Get yourself back in the right relationship with the Lord. Place your faith and, square, and anchor it squarely in the cross of Christ and allow the Spirit of God to move in you, to bring upon you what is needed for that time. We can't do without the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me say it this way. We can't operate to the best of our ability without the help and the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is necessary to our life. It's necessary for every single one of us. That's why that every single believer, they don't need you to just stop at salvation, at the salvation experience. They need to go through to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And then once that happens, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified, which allows the Spirit of God consistently on a consistent basis to work in your life. You want to get rid of life's annoyances? Let me tell you something. You're never going to get rid of life's annoyances. They're always going to be. Always going to be. And the fact is that at times the Holy Spirit doesn't remove the annoyance. He doesn't remove the source of your frustration. But he can change your response. Oh, come on now. He may not remove the mountain that's in front of you. But he can change your response to it. He may not move that annoyance that's right there, that frustration, but he can change your response, providing you with peace and patience to navigate through life's difficulties. Amen. When we say he anoints our heads with oil, that's what we're talking about. We've got to have the help of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit, because here's the reality. Your mind is the devil's playground. Your mind is the devil's playground. He will mess with your mind while God deals with your heart. He will mess with your mind, the devil will. And he will do so to try to steer you away from what God has done for you. More specifically, he will mess with your mind to try to move you away from the finished work of Christ. He will mess with your mind by providing these little annoyances in your life to try to get you to look to them and to get your focus off of Christ. 
Because if you are on, if you're focusing on the annoyances and the frustrations and the problems that these little quote-unquote spiritual flies will provide, then he's got you right where he wants you. But there's also a second reason why they use oil, why when he said that he anoints my head with oil. There is a disease that happens in sheep when it comes to the summertime. And it's more than just those annoyances and those flies that are around. It's called scab. Scab is an irritating, highly contagious disease common among sheep. It's caused by a minute microscopic parasite that proliferates in warm weather and spreads throughout the flock through direct contact between infected sheep and non-infected sheep. So how does that happen? If you ever notice, I'm not a sheep person, obviously. I think that's quite obvious. I don't own any sheep. But they say that sheep will be affectionate one with another by rubbing their heads together. That's how they kind of show affection, friendship. But when, these, when an infected sheep has scab, it's right here in the head. And when they begin to nuzzle up one with another, it's transferable. Scab goes from the infected and the non-infected becomes infected. They rub their heads together and it winds up spreading throughout the camp. So what is the antidote for that? Oil. What do, the shepherds do, what do shepherds do whenever this begins to happen? When they begin to see these things take place, the shepherd will begin to take a vat of oil. They would begin to put it all in a big, huge container. And they will literally take each sheep and dip, dip each sheep neck down into this oil. They can't do the head and dump it down because that will drown the sheep. But what they do for the head is they take the oil and they carefully start to massage it all over the head of the sheep. And when that begins to happen, they say it starts to calm the effects of that scab. Once again, oil, he anoints my head with oil. Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. Remember that. But how does this apply to us today. As I mentioned, your mind is the devil's playground. What happens if you get around somebody long enough that is a negative Nancy? Oh, come on now, you got to talk to me now. I know it's Wednesday night, you got to talk to me. What happens to us when we're around people that are not really good for us? Okay, let's do this old analogy. Let's say somebody is standing on a table and you've got another person that's standing down here on the floor and he reaches down. What's easier, to pull a person up or to yank a person down? It's easier to yank somebody down. So you need to be careful who you're around and who you surround yourself with. When you surround yourself with people that don't believe like you do, it will rub off on you. If you surround yourself with people that don't understand or don't believe the message of the cross, eventually it's going to rub off on you. Because all their talk is going to get into your mind and those, that, that, that thought process is going to transfer to you and all of a sudden you're going to start thinking, I don't really think that this cross stuff is going to work too well. You need to be very careful of who you associate yourself with. And let me go ahead and say this, and let me get back on my soapbox when it comes to social media. You better mind who you follow on social media, too. Amen. Not everybody on Facebook is called of God. I'm going to say that one more time. Not everybody that you follow is a prophet of God. 
Not everybody that you follow has God's best interest for your life. So you need to be very careful of what you allow to go into your mind and into your heart. Because when you surround yourself with people that have scab, spiritually speaking, it's going to infect you. So what is the antidote for that? You need to get full of the Holy Spirit and you need to leave those people alone. You need to leave them in the dust and you need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in you to renew your mind. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, I'm going to ask them to put this on the screen. I didn't ask them to do it earlier, and I apologize, and so I will wait just a moment. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We talk about this, we've mentioned this any number of times, what it means to renew the mind, but I want you to read this particular verse, and I want to read it to you. And be not conformed to this world. Stop right there. Church, we've got to understand we're not in this world, or we might be in this world, but we are not of this world. We don't need to be conformed to this world. We don't need to march to the world's drum. We don't need to act like the world. We, need to, we don't need to look like the world. We don't need to talk like the world. We don't need to be conformed to this world. But he says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need the Holy Spirit to work in you to renew your mind on a daily basis. I was looking at the commentary that Papal wrote on Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, renewing means the gradual conforming of the individual more and more to that new spiritual world and to that which they have been introduced and in which they now live and move. It is the restoration of the divine image. I thought I would get a little bit better than that one. This is the total and complete change of an outward expression, which is dependent upon the renovation of our mental process, which is done through the work of the Holy Spirit as our faith is anchored in Christ and Him crucified. We need the Holy Spirit each and every single day, not to be conformed to this world, but also to renew our minds on a daily basis. This is something that has to be done. Once again, you don't need to do this every six months. This is something that has to be done each and every single day. I'm here to tell you, church, if you really want for him, the Lord, to anoint your head with oil, it's got to be done each and every single day. You can't just go through life with one filling or with one touch. This must be something each that must be happened every single day for the rest of your life. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23. I'm going to wait for a minute. I'm going to ask them to put that on the screen. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23. Do you remember our study on Ephesians that we did last year? Paul would say, and be renewed. And look at the notes. It says a continuous act. Put it back on the screen. No, yeah, just leave it right there. A continuous act. Something that's done. Daily. Every single day. In the spirit of your mind has to do with the human will. The mind of the believer must be pulled from a dependence on self to a total dependence on Christ. Which can only be done by, the, by making the cross, ever the cross, the object of your faith. You see where we're going at with this? If you really want to have the, the, the Lord to anoint your head with oil, this is done by the Holy Spirit. It is done through the work of the Holy Spirit as our faith is anchored in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It can't happen any other way. Amen. We've got in life's annoyances, and we need the Holy Spirit's help there. And we've got this issue of scab, spiritually speaking, that is constantly being infected and passed from one person to the, to the next. And we need the Holy Spirit to renew our minds on a daily basis. And he says this, my cup runs over. My goodness. 
This expression indicates complete bliss, which is rarely experienced in life. It refers to our entire lives being full to overflowing with blessings. My cup runs over. Church, you don't serve a God who believes in a cup being, a cup being half full. You serve a God whose cup is constantly overflowing. That means whatever you need him to be, he can be it. Whatever you need him to do, he can do it. His cup constantly runs over. And guess what? As his cup runs over, that's where you can be too. My cup runs over. He anoints my head with oil, and my cup is running over with the blessings that God has provided. My Lord, I don't know about you, but that makes me happy. My cup runs over. Yeah, I might be facing some experiences in life, but I can tell you, my cup runs over. Why? Because of the goodness of God. Because of what he's done for me. My cup is running over with his blessings. My Lord, God is a blessing God. He wants your cup to run over. He wants to constantly have your cup running over with the goodness of God, with his blessings in your life. You don't need to be half full. You don't need to be half empty. He wants you to be overflowing with his goodness. My cup, Lord, my my cup runs over. It is experiencing that blessing of life that only can be had through faith in Christ and him crucified. And I like this, and singers, musicians, make your way back. Our shepherd's cup never runs empty, neither shall ours. I believe that. I believe that. Let me tell you something. You know, there's this thing about spiritual burnout, and yeah, it happens, but it shouldn't. It happens, but it shouldn't. You want to know why it happens? Because of misplaced faith. You want to know why it shouldn't happen? Or why it shouldn't happen is when our faith is anchored squarely in the cross of Christ and the Holy Spirit is anointing our heads with oil. He's working in our lives. He's renewing our mind on a daily basis. Guess what? Our cup will never begin to drip. It will constantly be overflowing with blessings, even in the midst of the annoyances of life. You can say, my cup runs over. He anoints my head with oil, and my cup runs over. That's what I want to experience. That's what I want my life to be. That's what I want your life to be. I want your cup to run over on a constant basis. But it has to be like this. Your faith cannot be placed in anything else. It has got to be placed in our shepherd. Our faith must be anchored in our shepherd. It cannot be in yourself. It cannot be in a preacher. It cannot be in a church. It can't can't be in a denomination. It cannot be in any movement. It's got to be in Christ alone. Christ and him crucified. If your faith is there, the Holy Spirit's working And I promise you this, he will daily anoint your head with oil and your cup will run over. It will run over. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Would you stand? Would you stand? Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. We are so thankful that you anoint our heads with oil and that our cup is running over. Bless your people tonight. We're asking that you would bless them when they leave this place. Bless them when they go home. Bless them when they wake up in the morning. We're asking, Lord, for your blessings to be on the share tomorrow and for Friday. We're asking, Lord, that you would begin to speak to hearts and lives all around the world to give to your work. We're asking this in the name of Jesus. And when they give, we're asking the blessings of God will come down and chase them down and overtake them in the name of Jesus. Bless your people. Be with us tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Come on, Robin. Sing. There you go. Jesus on the main line. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want.
were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call 1-800-288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.